Hello and welcome to Generation 16, the series that showcases the history of Sega's Mega Drive. I'm your host, Greg Seward. AD. A huge and mysterious pyramid was discovered on Mars. It was built by aliens to be their headquarters for a massive invasion against the Earth. To prevent the plot, a special task force, the Siglot Delta Platoon, was ordered to seek out and destroy the pyramid. In this episode, we continue our coverage of the Pioneer Laser Active with a closer look at Pyramid Patrol, the disc included with the Sega Pack module at launch. This is Delta Platoon Leader. All craft prepare to get underway. This is Twins Command. Affirmative. Good luck. Let's go. Sensors indicate enemy spacecraft ahead of us. Assume combat formation. Roger. 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 Fire. It is the year 2035. A pyramid has appeared on the planet Mars. The team sent to investigate this mysterious structure has removed some artifacts found within, waking the long slumbering Atlantean race, which has decided that it will retaliate by enslaving humanity. Just as things are at their most bleak, another ancient race, the Mu, reappear to supply the humans with the plans and technology to build the Siglod PMFX T05 space fighter, the only craft capable of defending against the Atlantean onslaught. The story for Pyramid Patrol is surprisingly deep considering we're talking about a pretty simple eight-level rail shooter here. The text covers one whole side of the slipcase insert and goes into a surprising amount of detail about the Atlantean and Mu races, their war, the evolution of humanity, and more. Alright! Pyramid at 12 o'clock. Assume attack formation. We're going in! All units, this is Delta Platoon Leader. We're now entering BL-29. This is Twins Command, Roger. Remember, be careful. As you can probably tell by now, Pyramid Patrol is a full motion video shooter in the vein of Sewer Shark. But rather than models and practical effects, the entire backdrop is made up of 3D rendered computer graphics, which was becoming more common by 1993. Games like Star Wars Rebel Assault, Mega Race, and Microcosm did the same thing that year. I assume CGI had gotten to the point that the visuals were good enough at a price that was cheaper than hiring real actors, camera operators, and building actual sets, or doing the entire experience using cell animation. After all, full motion video was the new biggest cost of game development during the multimedia revolution. The action in Pyramid Patrol could not be more straightforward. As you fly into the screen, enemies attack from the front and behind. As long as you shoot them and their projectiles before they hit you, you're going to survive. Avoiding incoming fire isn't an option because you don't actually have any control over your ship. Take away the full motion video backdrop and Pyramid Patrol is basically a shooting gallery. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Though without the ability to, say, use a light gun, or even have a tiny bit of navigational control over your ship, Pyramid Patrol pales in comparison to contemporaries like Lethal Enforcers or Sewer Shark. Delta Platoon, close formation, let's get out of here! You can either hold down the rapid fire button or use a charge shot. Though the first few times you play the game, the charge shot is next to useless. The only time I ever really bothered with it was during the boss fights, which appear to be timed affairs. 
Like here, where the boss has actually already been defeated, but appears to keep firing right up to the point it's scheduled to explode. Twins Command, this is Delta Platoon Leader. We are now proceeding to QX-03. That makes sense, since it seems like the bosses are actually part of the video file, rather than the sprites that make up all the other enemies in the game. As I replayed Pyramid Patrol, I found myself using the charge shot a bit more, as I'd memorized some of the particularly challenging bits, usually where multiple ships appear out of nowhere and all fire at once. If anything makes Pyramid Patrol stand out against its contemporaries, it has to be how slow it moves. The enemies fly around at a decent clip, but it seriously feels like you're moving at about 5 miles per hour. It's almost impossible to get excited about the experience. My theory about this lack of speed has to do with the fact that the full motion video backdrops in Pyramid Patrol are actually being reused from a virtual ride of the same name for Taito's Super D3 Boss Simulator. Simulation rides first started gaining prominence in the mid-1980s. Most point to Star Tours as the earliest example, a collaboration between Disney and Lucasfilm in 1987. Star Tours used full motion video combined with a moving capsule derived from flight simulation technology to take visitors on an action-packed ride to a galaxy far, far away, where the bumbling shuttle operator voiced by Paul Rubens inadvertently took his passengers directly into the battle between the Rebels and Imperial forces over the original Death Star, culminating in a trip down the trench behind Luke Skywalker. The film was shot specifically for the ride using the same models and techniques seen in the Star Wars films. It was a huge hit. But the idea didn't start with Disney or George Lucas. In 1979, Doron Precision Systems installed its first adventure capsule ride in the Queen Mary at Long Beach, California. The 12-seat SR2 used widescreen movies and sound effects mixed with capsule motion to simulate the sensation of riding a full-sized roller coaster. As Vice President Richard Ward put it, Doron was using the darkness and motion to fool with the inner ear of riders. Based in Binghamton, New York, Doron Precision was, and still is, a manufacturer of driving simulators that combined realistic, functional car interiors with video of different road situations. Because of this, Doron had video production and industrial manufacturing capabilities that allowed it to act on another opportunity, theme park rides, specifically roller coasters. Roller coasters that cost $85,000 to buy instead of a million and didn't require liability insurance and the threat of expensive lawsuits for possible death or injury. Not to mention taking up a lot less space and offering owners the ability to change rides as simply as updating the video and motion program. According to Doron President Carl Wenziger Jr., the company was simply repackaging its capabilities. Canadian television executive Moses Neimer took this idea to the next level with Tour of the Universe in 1985. Neimer was already a legend in Canada. The co-founder of City TV and Much Music, his stations were known for their spontaneous visual style. They featured no studios, but instead, segments and stand-ups could be broadcast from anywhere in the building. This trailblazing broadcast style was what Neimer called the living movie, a phrase he used frequently ever since he'd attended a play called Tamara. Set in 1920s Italy, Tamara took place in a 14-room mansion in Toronto. This murder mystery would play out in multiple rooms at once, requiring the audience to move about the building and experience the action up close. During intermission, the audience would gather for dinner, which doubled as a chance to compare notes and piece together the overall plot. Neimer was so smitten by the play that he invested in Tamara, becoming its executive producer. He was instrumental in exporting the play south of the border. Tamara's format probably sounds familiar. During its run in the United States, Jim Riley and Rob Fulop went to see Tamara and were inspired. They saw the interactive play as a perfect format for the branching movie project they were working on for Hasbro. They turned this inspiration into a demo called Scene of the Crime, for Hasbro's planned Nemo game system. This demo, of course, was the prototype for what would become Night Trap. Anyway, let's get back to simulation rides. During a trip to the UK, Nimer picked up a book to read on his flight home called Tour of the Universe, a sci-fi art book depicting what it might be like to travel to the stars. By the time Moses landed in Toronto, 
he was ready to buy the film rights for the book, seeing it as the perfect opportunity for another living movie project. He partnered with Douglas Trumbull, known for his special effects work in films like 2001, The Andromeda Strain, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, to produce a short ride film based on the book. This was partnered with a moving theater that was basically two Boeing 747 simulators stitched together. The whole thing was installed as part of a larger theme park style setting in the basement level of Toronto's CN Tower, and the first fixed location simulator ride in history was born. As riders watched the film, which was presented in a first person viewpoint, the cabinet would twist and tilt and sync with the visuals to create the sensation of flight. With the Doron Precision SR2 rides, you got a relatively small video at 24 frames per second, while Tour of the Universe's visuals were projected at 60 frames per second thanks to Trumbull's show scan technology, increasing the perception of immersion. Rather than 12 people in an SR2, Tour of the Universe held 40 people. And rather than a nondescript capsule, Tour of the Universe was part of a larger installation that immersed visitors in the world portrayed by the ride. Around the same time, Sega was introducing Tycon, or bodily sensation cabinets, to arcades, which basically operated on the same principle. Beginning with Hang-On in 1985, players would sit on or in Tycon cabinets in order to experience the physical sensation of whatever action was happening on screen. Like Tour of the Universe and Star Tours, most of these games were played from a first-person perspective. Space Harrier, Outrun, Afterburner, etc. Other arcade manufacturers soon followed suit. The beauty of Tycon cabinets was that, unlike massive, permanent installations like you'd find at major theme parks, they were relatively small, cheap, and while they took up more space than your standard arcade cabinet, they were relatively portable. Eventually, video game companies like Sega, Taito, and Namco started developing their own takes on Doron's original capsule simulator. As CGI became cheaper and easier to produce, the need to record video in an actual studio using live actors and practical effects disappeared. Plus, these arcade powerhouses were opening their own indoor theme parks in Japan and the rest of the world, so it only made sense to create relatively small simulator rides with easily swappable videos. Sega's 8-person AR1 system and Taito's 2-person IDEA system look like they evolved directly from the SR2 capsule. By the early 90s, it seemed both Sega and Taito were ready to take things to the next level. Capsule simulators were fine, but their limited motion was a restriction that needed to be slipped. Sega unveiled their R360 machine, which stood for Rotate 360. This arcade cabinet, which eventually shipped with a modified version of G-Lock, could rotate the player 360 degrees in any direction on two axes. It came complete with an emergency stop button and required an attendant to be present outside the machine at all times. Taito unveiled the D3 BOSS, an acronym for Dynamic Direct Dimension Burst Out System. Unlike the R360, which allowed players to control G-Lock and responded to their input, the D3 BOSS was a more traditional ride. Up to two people could climb into the completely sealed sphere, which could spin 360 degrees in any direction, and choose one of four rides to experience. Again, the ride had an emergency stop button inside and a ride attendant outside and presumably a bucket nearby. It was for Taito's follow-up ride, the Super D3 Boss, that Pyramid Patrol was first announced, as is evident from this hardware flyer. That little gold ship is nowhere to be seen in the version of Pyramid Patrol that we got on the Laser Active, though it does appear briefly in a montage of the system's games on Pioneer's Zoom Volume 7. So what does this have to do with how slowly Pyramid Patrol moves on the Laser Active? Well, here's the thing about rides like the R360 and D3 Boss. Getting tilted and turned in a cabinet like that can make even the most hardy people suffer from simulation sickness, where the best case scenario was riders getting dizzy and disoriented, worst case the attendant was cleaning someone's lunch out of the interior of the cabinet. So these experiences tended to be pretty short. The version of G-Lock used in Sega's R360 was actually a very short custom version of the game. It also had an option to be viewed simply as a ride, rather than something you could interact with. So how do you stretch a ride meant to last less than 10 minutes into an 8-level shooter? My theory is that you just slow the whole thing down to a snail's pace. 
which is unfortunate because I think speeding up the background video would actually help Pyramid Patrol a lot. Although it still wouldn't help the complete lack of interactivity between the player and the backgrounds. Throughout the game you have situations where environmental hazards appear to threaten you. Statues crumble into your path, lasers fire from corridor walls, or you might be navigating through razor sharp pendulums. But it's all window dressing, since you're never in danger of taking any damage from any of those things. The rendered backgrounds in Pyramid Patrol were done by High Tech Lab, a 3D production house that contributed to films like Wings of Aniyamize and the amazing Akira. The Ziglod PMFX T05 space fighter you pilot during the game was designed by Naoyuki Kato, known for his beautiful sci-fi illustrations. This fact is actually called out on the back of the game's jacket. Kato's illustrations had already graced the covers of games like R-Type, the Guardian Legend, and Super Alesta. He was one of the four charter members of Studio Nu, co-creators of the mighty Macross franchise. It's a shame then that you barely get to see his ship design during the game since you play the entire thing from a cockpit view. Taito somewhat corrected this problem when they repurposed the footage yet again for the 3DO's Pyramid Intruder in 1995. This is much more playable than Pyramid Patrol, mainly because the Siglod fighter is on screen, meaning you can actually avoid enemy fire rather than having to guess which projectiles are going to hit you and shoot them down. Plus, those non-interactive hazards from the laser active version of the game are now very dangerous, further making you feel like you're actually in the game world instead of flying over top of it. Pyramid Intruder even includes a few fully 3D gameplay sections. The game still isn't all that impressive, but it's kind of neat to see this concept evolve even further. As the included game for the Laser Active Sega Pack, Pyramid Patrol doesn't make much of an impression. Compared to the full motion video games folks may have been exposed to on the Sega CD up to that point, I'm sure Pyramid Patrol looked good on display in a shop, but it doesn't stand up to even a bit of scrutiny. Of course, of the three Mega LD games available at the Laser Active's launch, Pyramid Patrol was easily the best choice but we'll explore those games in the next couple episodes. And that does it for this episode of Generation 16. If you liked what you saw, please like, share, and subscribe, and consider supporting the show on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you for the next episode.